In biology, form fits function, and nowhere could that old antage be more true than in the world of protein structure. We're going to begin our chapter four coverage by talking about the core levels of protein structure. We're gonna begin tiny looking at how the peptide group and the peptide bond dictates overall structural uh, behavior of the entire protein. We're gonna work up from interactions of the peptide group to interactions between some of the carbon carbons and amine nitrogens and hydrogens and look at how overarching uh, repeating structural units can take place within a protein. From there we'll start to look at overarching three-dimensional structure and sometimes even the way in which multiple polypeptide chains interact with each other to make an even higher level of structure. Before we jump into that, however, I want to give a little bit of foreplay to this great event by looking at two large categories of protein structure. The first category is called globular, quite literally meaning that the protein tends to be basically spherical in nature. The outer regions of the protein tend to be very hydrophilic or water loving, where the hydrophobic regions are cowering away in the center of the protein away from that aqueous environment. One such example of a globular protein is everyone's favorite hemoglobin. I brought up a picture from the protein data bank of hemoglobin and we can see it in the JAMO version, and you can see the, the overarching globular structure of the protein. And we'll talk more about its unique structural elements later on. But what we can see is that it certainly is a roughly spherical sort of protein, and we see the... Um, the protein, the amino acids that are exposed to the aqueous exterior uh, tending to be very fairly water loving. So for example here, glutamate being a very water loving amino acid, certainly finding its home on the surface of the protein. And maybe in the center, some amino acids, again, uh, cowering away from water. Notice too that in a globular protein, we tend to see these clefts within the structure where molecules may bind. And these may be enzyme active sites or in the case of, of hemoglobin, and they may be transport sites, and we'll see the gaseous, um, the transport of gaseous molecules with hemoglobin. The other category, the other major category of proteins is called fibrous proteins. And um, for this one, I've used again the protein data bank to bring up a picture of a very famous fibrous protein. This is collagen. We'll talk more about the structure and function of collagen later in this chapter. But we can see certainly again form fitting function as this is um, a protein protein that very, it's very fibrous, very long and extended, fitting its function on tension bearing uh, sort of padding role that it plays uh, functionally. So very cool to see the two different categories and the way that form fits function. As we now ready to hop into our coverage of the four levels of protein structure, beginning with amino acid sequence and then looking at regularly repeating structures, finally working our way up to three dimensional structures and even even higher levels. Four levels of protein structure, beginning with the simplest, which we already know about, called primary structure. So primary structure, what that means is the linear sequence of the protein. So the the amino to carboxyl sequence. So for example, in this, ex this um, example that's given right here, amino to carboxyl, we always write it that way. The primary sequence would be glycine, aspartate, arginine, valine, so on. So it's the actual sequence of amino acids um, going and reading from the amino terminus to the carboxyl terminus. Now we'll look at a model here in just a minute, but basically you visualize that because of the um, overall natures of the amino acids that make up the primary structure, that will lead to the formation of, of greater levels of structure. So for example, um, you may get a particular region of amino acids with uh, the characteristics that allow them to interact in certain ways that may lead to the higher levels. So the next level up then is secondary structure, and that refers to basically local regularly repeating units. What's happening in secondary structure is that the the um, amide hydrogens 
are interacting with the carbonyl oxygen. And so we're seeing the actual interactions between the backbone elements. So if we remember and just kind of draw roughly on here um, that we've got the peptide bond, right? And of course within a protein many of those peptide bonds but what you see in secondary structure is that um, various regions on the polypeptide chain, the long polypeptide chain, the oxygen of one region on the carbonyl here will interact with the hydrogens of uh, another region of the protein on the nitrogen of the amide. So you see these structures that can form because of those local interactions. So there are a couple examples that we'll just point out here. We will look closer at these later. Um, the alpha helix and the beta sheet. And we'll see a lot of structural depictions of alpha helices and beta sheets, but they are secondary structure elements. So you could say that um, both alpha helix and the beta sheet are secondary and and let's let's abbreviate here let's be lazy secondary structure elements and we could even just uh, roughly draw those so that you are recognizing that often an alpha helix is drawn like this we will look more at this later in sort of what we would call a ribbon diagram a beta sheet often drawn um, you know somewhat similarly um, this is just a, a ribbon diagram of it where you see the arrows often in the beta sheet. And very often just the backbone region of the protein shown when indicating beta sheet and alpha helical structure. So it gives you kind of a rough idea of what we're talking about there. We will look more in depth at these in just a minute. So the, the local regularly repeating units, that's secondary structure, and I bet by now you can guess that the next level up is going to be tertiary structure. And tertiary structure is going to refer to the overall three-dimensional structure of the protein. That is, it's going to be looking at how um, alpha helices and beta sheets interact with one another in 3D space, their overall fold. So it, it basically is the way in which secondary structure elements interact with one another. And that gives rise to a full three-dimensional structure a fully folded compacted chain. And oftentimes when tertiary structure fold forms, and I'm going to show you on a model in just a second, you will uh, tend to see very distinct regions um, of tertiary structure. So you may see this fully folded region, um, and then you may see a little region of polypeptide chain bridging it with another fully folded region. And those distinct globular units are called domains. Now I often tend to think of a domain as being a little bit like East and West Laramie. Um, you have this region of structure, and actually let me just draw you a quick cartoon of this. And say you've got this region where you've got these alpha helices, these beta sheets, uh, alpha helix, they're all interacting very tightly with one another. And then you've got this region here of a sort of connective region and then you've got this another fully folded kind of compacted area over here with some alpha helices and sheets and such. And we would say that this is one domain here. I should have used a different color. Shame on me. Um, this is one domain here. And then linked by a, a polypeptide region, you have a second domain. It's, it's the same protein, but there's two very distinctive domains in it, two very distinctive regions. So stabilized then by um, amino acid interactions on the side groups, so tertiary structure, unlike secondary structure, um, is determined by non-neighboring regions of, of the polypeptide chain and um, often by interactions between side groups. Um, so very important distinguish dis distinguishing characteristic there between secondary and tertiary structure is the secondary structure um, really relies on a, a neighborhood of amino acids that are next to each other within 
a, a primary sequence and they they interact with one another whereas tertiary structure really depends upon um, the the varying neighborhoods getting together and interacting um, because they're going to have to be distant I guess in 3d space and then pulled together by tertiary structure I hope that that kind of makes sense so the next level up I bet by now you've even filled in the blank quaternary structure and this is a situation that only occurs in some proteins. For example, our very favorite that we already looked at, hemoglobin. What happens in quaternary structure is that there is more than one polypeptide chain. So you get two very separate polypeptide chains and they will interact with one another in their fully folded you know, unit. So the two different separate polypeptide chains will fold into secondary structure, fold into tertiary structure and then come together and interact with one another. And so that's quaternary structure is the interactions between um, you know, separate polypeptide chains. Okay, let's take a moment to go ahead and look at a model. Okay, I have two different models here and I want you to use your um, imagination in bearing with me on, on, the, uh, on the models. Um, if you assume then that um, there's not much you can't do with uh, styrofoam beads and uh, pipe cleaners, I find. Um, so if you bear with me in assuming then that this is a polypeptide chain, this is the amino terminal amino acid and then you can see the primary sequence headed on down. So for example, maybe this is serine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, phenylalanine, threonine, so on down the line, right? Um, amino all the way till finally this is our most carboxyl amino acid. So this is our chain of amino acids and it's currently showing you only primary structure, right? All we can see right now is just the linear sequence amino to carboxyl. But we know that that will help to determine what the secondary, tertiary, and potential quaternary structures are as well. So let's say, for example, that because of the nature of these amino acids in this first region, that they tend to fold into the secondary structure, um, alpha helix. So we might see them then folding into a helical structure here. We'll talk more about that structure in, in a little while. And forming the first region of secondary structure. So we have it there then, um, a region of alpha helix. So an alpha helical region, now this not, not only represents uh, primary structure where you can see the, the sequence of amino acids, but it also has one secondary structure element. Perhaps ladder down towards the carboxyl area, perhaps this folds into a region of beta sheet. And perhaps we end up then um, with a region of a sheet towards the, the latter half of the the primary sequence. So we may get then secondary structure elements. Now of course we know that we have higher level structure as well. We also have tertiary structure. So we could see then that this alpha helix maybe interacts with the beta sheet in some way in three-dimensional space giving an overall tertiary structure. Now I have another model that helps to see tertiary structure just a little bit better. Um, these are made out of, of a thinner wire and I think they're kind of nice in that respect. So um, this is a ch this is showing um, both secondary structure elements and tertiary structure elements. So you can see on the wire you've got a region of alpha helix, a short region of beta sheet, and then another region of alpha helix. Now tertiary structure that refers to how these guys orient with respect to one another in 3D space. So a protein that is like this has a different tertiary structure than does one like this, right? So it's all about their overall three-dimensional structure. And likewise, something like this is very different in overall tertiary structure. Now, they all have the same secondary structure elements, right? It's just that the tertiary structure, the overall 3D structure is different, right? Okay, cool. So um, let's look then at something that might have quaternary structure. In that case, in quaternary structure, it means you have two separate 
polypeptide chains. So you have this polypeptide chain and this polypeptide chain. They've separately folded into secondary structure elements and to tertiary structure elements, and now they're interacting with one another, and you can see that they gain quaternary structure by interacting with one another. Now, not every protein has quaternary structure because not every protein is made up of multiple polypeptide chains. Hemoglobin is, and we'll be looking at that one a little bit more. So, primary structure, linear sequence of amino acids, secondary structure, elements, things like alpha helices and beta sheets, um, tertiary structure, how they interact with each other in three-dimensional space, what is the overall structure of the protein in 3D space, right? Quaternary structure, more than one polypeptide chain interacting with one another. Okay, that's a wrap. Now, determining the overall 3D structure for a protein is not always an easy task. And in fact, it took many brilliant scientists a lot of years to determine how to actually do this. One of the ways that they came up with, in fact, it was a woman named Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkins who pioneered this technique. One of the ways that she came up with was to actually grow a crystal of the protein, some uh, often complete with some of the binding molecules that, that adhere to the protein in vivo and water molecules and to grow this crystal up and then hit it with a beam of electrons look at the diffraction pattern of that beam of electrons and then in conjunction with knowing the primary structure this diffraction pattern could allow the researcher to de determine the overall three-dimensional structure and in fact even now this is the technique that is used by most scientists to determine the overall 3D structure of a protein. This is something called X-ray crystallography and it is a very effective way to do this. Um, we'll just write that down. But it does have its downfalls and in fact one of the biggest downfalls is that it's hard to grow a crystal, especially to grow a crystal of a large protein. And so some scientists have actually turned to another technique which many of you have heard of. It's called NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. And what they can look at is within the presence of a magnetic field, they can look at the interactions of atoms in the protein and actually determine structure. So this is um, added to our knowledge base of protein structure, overall 3D shape, and in fact NMR has some benefits in that it actually shows the very slight molecular changes um, in structure that occur. It's sort of a, a it's a very, very tiny changes um, that are, are constantly occurring that are termed breathing, and so it's kind of a fitting term for it, and so it really gives us an idea of their fluid changes um, in, within an aqueous solution. So once a, a scientist has determined the overall structure, the overall 3D structure of a protein, there are several ways that are used to depict this structure. And depending upon what you're interested in, you might want to look at different depictions of the structure. So let's go ahead and look at a couple of different depictions from your textbook. And in just a moment, I promise we will come back and talk about the RCSB protein data bank because it is wicked cool and shows a lot of these protein depictions. So some of the ways that you might depict protein structure include the space filling model that you see in A up here. So the space filling is exactly what it says. It shows all of the uh, molecular structure so that you can really get an idea of the oh, nuances of the surficial um, ins and outs of the protein, if you will. Now sometimes this is useful, but other times you want to know something about secondary structure, and so you're more likely to use a ribbon diagram. And in fact, in our book, and, and in fact in general, ribbon diagrams are the most common way to represent a protein. So in this ribbon diagram, you can see that the secondary structure elements, such as the alpha helix and the beta sheet regions, and this is accomplished by really only only showing in this particular depiction the backbone molecules. So the side groups aren't really taken into account there in showing that overall structure. Now the last method down here is really just a molecular depiction where you can see, um, at least in the region of interest, you can actually see the molecular interactions. And you notice that the backbone of the protein here is still shown in a ribbon conformation. So different ways to depict proteins, uh, different ways to look at those. Now the RCSB protein data bank has got to be one of the most radtastic features and resources that you can find online.
It will show you space filling diagrams and ribbon diagrams, and you can get structural data about proteins that maybe you never even dreamed you could. So I hope everybody has found their way to this site on your own computers or whatever mobile device you're using, because this is going to be a place that you want to regularly visit. Because for one thing, let's face it, it has the protein of the month, or at least the molecule of the month, and it features every single month something new and interesting. For example, the May molecule of the month, you guessed it, the Zika virus. So trendy right now, the Zika virus in this picture is showed in a very much of a space filling way where you can see the outer capsid of that protein of that, uh, the outer capsid proteins of that virus. Um, so this virus, remember, a single-stranded RNA virus, one that was very popularized recently, and its transmission um, via, um, it's an arbovirus, an arthropod-borne virus. So in any case, here's the thing, if you email me at any time telling me the new molecule of the month, I will so give you extra credit. But let's type in some other uh, protein, and actually let's go ahead and go with one that we've just recently talked about. Remember talking about cytochrome C, that small protein that we looked at um, the evolutionary conservation over time. So I'm just going to um, see if we can pull up some um, depictions of cytochrome C. And you'll notice that you can look in different organisms ranging from E. coli to humans. Here we go. Solution structure of reduced human cytochrome C. So we can go ahead and click on that and see if we can get some more um, cool depictions of this molecule. Um, this one, oh, hey, look, this one, this particular one is an NMR um, depiction, so meaning that we use nuclear magnetic resonance to derive that image, and it actually is really neat because you can actually see the breathing within the molecular depictions, so you can see kind of this overlaid structures over time where you can actually see these minute changes in the way in which the uh, cytochrome C molecule is breathing. So that's a pretty neat depiction, but hey, let's go to the JS mole depiction. So there we go, the beautiful ribbon diagram uh, showing cytochrome C, and you can rotate that through three-dimensional uh, space and recognize the uh, alpha helical secondary structures as well as the overall tertiary structure and um, the, the porphyrin binding site, the cleft for the binding of the porphyrin, which we'll talk a bit more about that. So uh, protein data being absolutely a uh, rad um, feature that you can access online and it's free to you and it's so cool. So do it and send me the, the molecule of the month, um, each of the months of our semester.